Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for April 3rd, 2023. It's the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, or Jepler, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny little computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing your hardware from adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server, you can join us anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. Uh, like today, the meeting usually occurs on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, we do have a notes document to view a calendar because we... Um, sorry about that. Uh, we do have a calendar that will tell you about uh, variations in that schedule, usually because of uh, US holidays. There's a link for that in the notes document. So check that out just to keep up to date. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. I already mentioned there's a notes document. Uh, the notes document, when you are reading it after the fact, We'll have timestamps so that you can skip to the parts of the video that interest you the most. Um, after the meeting, in Discord we post a link to the next meeting's notes in the CircuitPython dev channel of the Adafruit Discord. To find it, look in the pinned messages so that you can add your notes for the subsequent meeting. And just a reminder, if you uh, have stuff to share with us but cannot attend, you can leave your hug reports and status updates in the document and the host will read them out for you. So, the structure of this meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news, a look at all things CircuitPython on a, and Python on hardware in the community. Uh, it's a preview of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. Next after that is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to individually. Uh, third is hug reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing and a way to take the time to recognize the awesome folks around us in the community, such as the person who has saved my bacon by remembering to uh, take some notes from the, <laughs> uh, from the newsletter and put it into the document. Thank you. Uh, up after that is status updates. In some ways, it is the meat or protein of the meeting, the time to report on what you've been up to. Uh, take a couple of minutes. We want to hear about what you've been doing in CircuitPython since the last meeting and what you'll be up to uh, in the next week or until you're able to get back with us. And we do like to get to know each other a little better as people, so if you have something else from your life that uh, you'd like to share that is appropriate, please do. And then the final part, which is optional, is called In the Weeds. If we need to have long-form discussion um, about a topic of interest to multiple people that doesn't really fit within the uh, brief format of status updates, that is where you need to do it. And if you have a topic, please add it to the document after any other items that are already there. And again, I will call on folks in the document order. And that covers how the meeting will go. And you've got a sense of uh, how I'll be doing all meeting with uh, just how this all went so far. Anyway, but we are going to move on to community news. Uh, first up, we had two new versions of CircuitPython released, thanks uh, to Dan, who actually did the release work, uh, the mechanical stuff on GitHub, and as well as to all contributors, which there was a nice list of them. The stable release is now 8.0.5, and there's also a new beta version, 8.1.0 beta 1. And there are links to the blog post and the release notes so check those out to find more about what is fixed and who um, has been fixing stuff. There are also some fun new features in that beta release. Next up, it's more version news. A sneak peek uh, at MicroPython release 1.20. Damien George, creator of MicroPython, uh, gives an update on the pre-release of MicroPython version R1.20 and a demonstration of Bluetooth low energy on the Raspberry Pi Pico W in this video from the March MicroPython meeting in Melbourne, Australia. And thank you for getting that those links in the channel. Uh, that includes a YouTube. Check that out after we're done with this meeting. And last up, PyBricks. 
MicroPython on LEGO controllers is gaining popularity. Uh, more projects are appearing using Pybrex, a version of MicroPython which runs on LEGO Mindstorm hubs. Uh, and there's a YouTube uh, video by Kevin McAleer, sorry for pronouncing your name, who presents Exploring Pybrex, LEGO Mindstorms Evolved. That also looks like fun, but you have to wait till we're done with this meeting to check it out, sorry. So, the CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are on adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. Um, it's kind of nominally CircuitPython, but we highlight the latest Python and hardware related news from around the web. That includes CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. And um, occasionally stuff that's just so cool you've got to share it. So for instance, we didn't feature it here, but I think we are going to talk about a fun uh, video synthesizer project, even though it runs on Arduino, we're excited about it. Um, and a couple of us are thinking, huh, how can we do a version of this in Py Circuit Python? But anyway, getting ahead of ourselves. The call to action here, besides subscribing, is to contribute your project or a project you ran across on the internet. So you can go on GitHub and edit the draft and make the draft for the subsequent week article and um, submit a pull request. Or you can tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter, or uh, tag your post on Mastodon, also with hashtag CircuitPython. Or finally, you can email cpnews at adafruit.com. And that wraps up community news, which brings us to the next section, the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So we run um, a daily task that scours GitHub and gathers information about activity over the last seven days. And we aggregate that and talk about it within this section. And um, because of the kind of the nature of these reports and the, the seven day cutoff, occasionally we miss recognizing folks. And what I want to focus on is we um, do recognize folks. Uh, just sometimes when you fall into that gap, we'll miss something anyway. But here are the stats. Overall, we had 31 pull requests merged from 21 authors and nine reviewers. So thanks to all of those, uh, including Ozi Gerbostan, Dugish C, Sentis, uh, Thess or Tess, um, and Rishi A are some uh, names that come up less frequently. Uh, also, G. Neveroff, who's recently started making some contributions to CircuitPython. So a big thanks to all those people, as well as a thanks to our nine people who reviewed in an official capacity, as well as everybody who helped us with comments on issues and pull requests. Um, and of course, it's also nice to note, in addition to the nice 31 pull requests merged, we uh, closed more issues than we opened, net down of four issues with about 13 people um, contributing on either side there. And next up, Dan will tell us more about what's going on in the core. Okay, um, so there were, in the core of CircuitPython, there were 25 pull requests merged in about the last week. There were 18 authors. As Jeff mentioned, Osgur Bastan and Dogush C, they um, represent a Turkish uh, microcontroller board company that submitted a bunch of new board definitions. And then Saintis is new and T. Hess uh, also is new, as mentioned. So, um, and there were, so there are 18 authors and six reviewers, and there are now 19 open pull requests. I closed a bunch uh, that were kind of stale and said, we opened them if, if something happens. So we're back down to less than 25, which is great. They're all on one page now. Um, in the past week, there were eight closed issues by three people and six issues closed, opened by four people. There are now 630 open issues for CircuitPython. Uh, in that group, there are no open issues for the current 8.0.x stable release cycle. There are 15 issues for 8.1.0, but there could be some triage done there. There probably aren't 15 that we need to fix for 8.1.0 final. There are 66 open that we'd like to fix by the end of 8xx. And there are 21 issues in the 900. Um, for the 900 milestone, which uh, are things that we want to defer before uh, and not make part of 8xx. 
there are also 20 issues labeled as libraries. A lot of those are library suggestions. There are 503 uh, long-term issues, which might be enhancements or very minor bugs. There are seven issues labeled as support, which means that they probably are not bugs, but we need more information. Um, or that we're just helping the person in GitHub that we prefer to help in Discord or the forums. And there are uh, four issues labeled as third party where we're, uh, those issues are stalled because we're awaiting something from a third party uh, software supplier. And there are zero issues not assigned a milestone. So we've triaged everything successfully. And that's it for the core. Thank you, Dan. Uh, next up are the libraries. Katni, are you able to take over and tell us about that? Absolutely. Thank you. This section applies to uh, all of the CircuitPython libraries, including all of the libraries in the CircuitPython community bundle and all of the libraries that are uh, Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything beginning with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore. So across all of those repositories, we had five pull requests merged from four different authors and five reviewers. Um, two of those were 21 and 29 days old, so I'm glad to see that we're still getting through some older ones. And we have 45 open pull requests. Uh, there were five closed issues by three people and four open by four people, leaving 603 open issues. 74 of those are labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org contributing. You'll find all of this information and more. If you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull request. If you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, take a look at the code and leave a comment. Once you're comfortable with that, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you're interested in contributing documentation or code, check out the open issues. You can search that page uh, and find something that interests you and leave a comment and let us know that you're going to work on it. And uh, if you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. There is a guide on contributing to uh, CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and we're always available on Discord to help. We want to make sure that you're able to contribute in a way that works for you. Library PyPI weekly download stats for this week uh, is actually significantly lower than uh, it has been in a while, which I found interesting. I noticed this um, last week as well. Uh, we had across uh, 309 libraries, uh, 70,060 PyPI downloads, and um, the top 10 are in the notes. There's no surprises on this list um, to me uh, this week, uh, except for the fact that the overall um, being lower also means that the specific numbers on the top 10 are also lower. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had a few updated libraries, but no new libraries. Um, and I guess that's, that's what I've got. There we are for the libraries. All right, thanks, Katni. And now we will round out the section with the stats on Blinka. Melissa, are you able to pop in and talk about that? Yeah, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had one pull request merged by one author and one reviewer. Uh, there are currently seven open pull requests amongst all the different repositories that are Blinka related. And there were three closed issues by two people and one open by one person, leaving a net of 95 open issues. There were 14,422 PyPI downloads in the last week, and we are at 14,766 PyWheels downloads in the last month. And we are at 101 uh, supported ports. And that's it. Thank you. Next up is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list uh, to give everyone a chance to participate. And a reminder, if you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. Um, so that is what I'll do. And because I am in a state of disorganization this morning, I only have a group hug. Uh, then from C. Grover, who's text only, C. Grover has a hug to Foamy Guy for demonstrating bitmap tools features on his stream. May become just what the doctor ordered for a current project. A second hug to Paul Cutler for bringing back the Life Essential CircuitPython podcast. And finally, a group hug. 
And next, we will hear from Dan. All right. Um, thanks to Dave Putz and Jay Schachter, who are working on debugging ESP32 S3 Pulse IO. Um, thanks very much to Greg Neveroff for fixing a serious regression in 8.0 having to do uh, with um, network Wi Fi networks. And thanks to Pulses Paradoxus in Discord, who was having trouble with a, a BLE, BLE heart monitor. And though I'm not sure I've solved their particular problem, they, I suggested they try using. Um, Blinka BLEIO, which works on host computers, and it was a, it's an incredible pain to set up right now because it requires certain versions of Python and uses some obsolete software. So that goaded me into um, fixing it up and bringing it up to date, and it was a lot less work than I thought. So and, and Scott has just merged that, so that'll be released uh, really soon, and, and I can clean up a bunch of caveats that are in the guide right now too. So I'm happy about that. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Next up is DJ Devon Three. Uh, I think you're going to start out if your net connection is working right now. Is that right? There we go. Double mute. All right. Uh, yes, Hi. everything seems to be working. Okay. Uh, I would like to send a hug to Jose David. Naradoc and Anic Data for helping me troubleshoot a hardware issue on a Feather M4 Express. Figured out I caused the issue with angle cutters removing the header pins, uh, and they offered some advice on how to fix that, as well as put it back in working condition. So now that one is working, and I didn't have to throw away the the feather. Uh, uh, hug to Naradoc for helping, quote unquote, by writing a CSV dict reader example using Tectrix. Uh, Circuit Python CSV library, which is in the community bundle, that both of those were just a tremendous help for my project, um, which I will get into later. Another hug to Naradoc, Spavlot, and Katni for helping narrow down a weird issue on the 14 segment um, display backpacks, and that issue I've put in the weeds for discussion. A hug to Foamy Guy for reviewing and pushing the Steam API request example PR. Another hug f to him for dealing with computer issues this weekend, and I hope you get everything fixed up and back to normal and back to streaming okay. Thanks, DJ. All right, next up, I have a note to read from David Glode, who has a hug for you, DJ Devon3, for the TR Cowbell and other gifts that reached my place exactly a week ago. And next up is Foamy Guy. Hello. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, hugs this week for me. Uh, thank you to uh, David Awesome Zero One, uh, which is not a member of our community, but they are in the System76 Discord, um, and they helped me out tremendously, very patiently, to get uh, through some troubleshooting and attempts to fix my PC. Uh, would not be anywhere near as close to working without their help. So huge thanks to them. Uh, Jose David uh, for adding the new uh, functionality inside bitmap tools to draw circles um, and a hug report uh, for Nerdoc for finding and documenting an issue that's relating to multiple displays. Uh, most likely I think this was introduced when the show API got refactored um, and I was already kind of getting my mind on multi-display stuff anyway so uh, the timing actually was perfect. Um, this will be an interesting thing to jump into and try to figure out. Thanks. All right. Next, I have a few hug reports from Jose David, who has a hug for Rishi A for updating the Circup installation instructions in the ENS160 library, and a hug for Dan, Foamy Guy Gambler, for comments, suggestions, and insights for the Bitmap Tools Circle pull request. And that brings us to Katni. Hello. Hi. I have a hug report for Carter and Ed Keys. Um... Uh, here on Discord for helping me uh, with sorting out uh, what qualified as power and charging circuitry on a feather board. Um, there is a page in all the feather guides that is power management and um, the first image on or the second image on that page is uh, highlighting all of the power and charging circuitry which I've never actually had to create that image before and um, was incredibly unclear on things, but started using a particular tool in Eagle to sort out what was going where and what was necessary for what. 
and then um, couldn't find a couple of the specif specified things that were supposed to go in the image, and um, uh, Carter and, and Ed Keys helped me sort out the last the last bit, so that was uh, really helpful. To Solar Slurpee on GitHub for being willing to jump in and help me out with an upcoming guide, the topic of which happens to fall into their wheelhouse. Uh, I am completely new to it, so this is going to be uh, a very um, seriously helpful situation there. To the helpers on Discord, so that's everybody in any of the helpers roles, for a very thoughtful discussion on some logistical things recently. Um, I came to the conversation very late, but the um, conversation that had occurred was incredibly um, incredibly thoughtful and uh, useful and helpful, and we were able to uh, get a couple of action items out of that and uh, make things better in the community. And a group hug to everyone, but especially to those I missed. I'm really bad about remembering things. Thanks, Katni. And next, we are back to you, Melissa. Hello. Uh, I wanted to give a hack report to, uh, I'm not sure how you pronounce this, Creechy for submitting a whole bunch of updates to the online circuit python code editor including one that migrates the entire build system to a newer one uh one to Anne for uh quickly merging uh, my pull request for a learn guide i'm working on finishing and to scott i uh, hope you and your son are feeling better soon and uh group back to everyone else thank you and next is paul cutler i have a group hug for everyone thank Thanks. you Okay, Tammy Makes Things is text only today, but has a group hug for everyone. And that brings us to you, Scott. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Um, first, uh, a hug to you for covering this week for me. I swapped last week to Dan because um, Ari was sick last week. Um, if you don't know, I have COVID. I'm getting over it. Ari has COVID too. He's further along getting over it than I am, but I talked to a neighbor yesterday and thought, I don't think I could talk for an hour without coughing up a storm. So thanks to Jeff uh, for covering for me. Um, thanks to Katni for always improving the CircuitPython community in Discord. I dropped in like the helper's channel or something and saw a very thoughtful suggestion on how to make things better. So I really appreciate you uh, constantly improving CircuitPython and Adafruit and Discord, Katni. So thank you. And then um, last up, uh, thank you to Dan for doing two more CircuitPython releases. It's really helpful to, to keep everything moving, except for me. All right. Thanks, Scott. Um, last, I have notes from Tetric, who couldn't make it to the meeting today. Tetric has a hug for Dan H. for keeping me in the loop about CI updates. Always good to know when it breaks. A hug for DJ Devon 3 for using my CSV helper library. I'm always excited when others find utility in libraries especially ones in the community bundle. And one last group hug, and that finishes hug reports. So we will move on to status updates. It's our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start, then we'll go through the document in order. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide quick tips and tricks relevant to what people are talking about. But if it's going to be anything long, just a general reminder, we will want to talk about it in the final section of In the Weeds. And with that, I'll get us started. Um, I published a second Adafruit Learn Guide that uses ChatGPT. This one is subtitled Press Button, Get Superpower. It works with the um, Pico W and a little OLED display and uh, connects to the API. And I urge you to check it out. It's a great jumping off point if you want to play with ChatGPT and CircuitPython together. I finished up a couple of pull requests. I think that they are done, implementing I2S out and PWM audio out on the M7. There was a bug that uh, Dan had identified a little later in the week, last week, that led to one final bug fix, but otherwise it seems pretty solid. I tested the limits of audio mixer on M7, uh, playing audio files from SD card. I tried two different SD cards, and one was able to mix four simultaneous samples, and another was able to mix eight simultaneous samples, both at 22 kilohertz uh, mono with 16-bit audio quality. I took one afternoon out to spend uh, time learning the ESP Now module. 
I was considering doing a wireless keyboard project, but that's probably not the most appropriate use for it. I'd still like to find a use case and do something useful with it, but I'm going to set it aside again for now. Um, so what I've been working on since Wednesday approximately was uh, we have a module called SynthIO, which you can use to play a simple um, MIDI file with up to two notes, and it's just very basic square wave synthesis. And I've been working on expanding its capabilities. So on the M7, you'll be able to mix up to 12 voices, and you can pass in any single cycle waveform. So in addition to a square wave, you could do a sine wave or a sawtooth or a triangle or even other things, uh, whatever you imagine. You could probably do a noise waveform with it. Um, and another thing that I'm working on related to that is the design really was just to play a MIDI file. So if you, for instance, wanted to use it where if you press this key, you get this note, and if you press three keys, you get a chord, it wasn't designed to work that way. So there's some uh, redesign and refactoring to make it work kind of in a real-time synthesis way versus playing back a, a MIDI file way. And then I have some other capabilities I'm going to look at adding as well uh, as time goes on. Um, I'll talk to, I wrote here that I'll talk to JP when he returns, but uh, we actually decided in our internal meeting without JP that the next thing I would be look at, looking at is adding um, volume control and envelope so that a note, a note can like start at a low volume and ramp up the volume or gently fade out. So envelope is the term for that. Um, let's see. And finally, I have some uh, guide pages to write for CircuitPython pointers with the audio IO stuff fresh in my memory. And a note, I will be out Friday and I will return on May 1st, which is a Monday. So I'll see y'all in a little less than a month. All right, that's it for me. And next I have notes from C. Grover who writes, the Eurorack Precision VCO module is coming along nicely. The automatic analog waveform baseline bias algorithm is working perfectly. Woo. It removes the DC offset of a signal. This was accomplished in CircuitPython using an itsy bitsy DAC output and analog input to monitor and control an analog op amp circuit. Working on the UI now and plan to apply bitmap tools liberally. All right, and next we'll hear from Dan and then DJ Devin3. Okay, thanks. So as mentioned, I did two, two CircuitPython releases um, last Thursday, 8.05 and 8.10 beta 1. Um, 8.05 was um, just has it's fixed by Jeff uh, with about editing settings.toml. Um, I have a pull request I made, uh, which I think has been merged for uh, to add wifi.radio.connected and wifi.radio.ap, that is access point active read-only properties, which a number of people had thought would be useful, and I had had that sort of in progress for months and then just finished it. Um, I, the current beta also handles um, HID out reports. Uh, those are reports from the host, uh, in and out or f with respect to the host in, 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 when you're talking in, in USB LAN, and it, it handles uh, reports with no report ID properly, which is what you need for raw HID, which is not common, but some people really need it. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned, um, uh, I brought Blinka, Adafruit Blinka BLEI up to date with the latest, to the latest version of Bleak uh, because it was really suffering from bit rot in a number of ways. So that's, uh, that'll be released shortly. Okay, that's it. Okie doke. Next up is DJ Devon 3. Oh, there we go. Double muted. All right. Okay. I, hear you now. Uh, <laughs> I found out the hard way not to use angle cutters underneath header pins uh, to remove them, which I've already gotten some great advice on. It's been scratching the solder mask on the boards as I, I lift up the little. Uh, plastic parts and I did it last night again and noticed it immediately which is how I know that this problem isn't just magically appearing out of nowhere I'm doing it uh, uh, so whatever pin the scratches next to can get soldered straight to the exposed ground plane so it scratches off a little bit of the solder mask which is all ground plane 
This is especially uh, bad if it's right next to the three volt pin or any power pin as it gets soldered straight to ground, which then makes the ground plane a power plane. And there goes all of your GPIO. Every GPIO goes, uh, yeah. Yes, I had a moment and I plugged it in like that intentionally just for science and it causes every GPIO to get locked high because there's no more ground plane. Thankfully, I can say this does not cause any electrical damage and is fixable with nail polish or conformal coating and careful soldering. From now on, I will not be doing it that way anymore. Uh, I completed the 14 segment display project. It was supposed to be an API project originally. I quickly, quickly figured out that the API does not have endpoints uh, to the data that I was expected to work with. The endpoints just don't exist. So the solution ended up requiring a batch script, automatic dam downloads, uh, CSV parsing, shout out to Tetric and Nerdoc, which has nothing to do with an API, uh, but is it's all still perfectly within the Steam Partner Terms of Service. Now, I will be submitting a Dict Reader example to Tectric CSV Community Library because there wasn't one and we kind of struggled to make sure that it could read correctly. I'd love to say I wrote it, but honestly, it was it was all Nerdoc. I just adapted his example to work for my project and both Nerdoc and Tectric's examples saved me days, if not weeks, of learning to work with CSVs. I'm much more familiar with JSON than CSVs. Uh, post that. Uh, days later, I improved the project by writing my first real Python script, which executes from a Windows batch script instead, and parses the CSV fi file onto the ESP32, which took about normally 20 seconds for the ESP32 to parse the 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 CSV file, which was originally about one. Or, I'm sorry, 64 kilobytes. Um, instead, I let Python do it in milliseconds, in which and then it piped the data out to the, the feather. And so I was able to take, in total, one megabyte of CSV files, collate it down, parse it down to just the 200 bytes of data that they wanted. And I'm forever grateful to the game company that entrusted me with Steam Partner level access to experience the back end and create such a cool project for them. Uh, I designed and 3D printed the enclosure for the 14 segment display. I made a Feather Pi Pico Cutie Pie all in one I2S amplifier board that I showed on Show and Tell, specifically designed to replace the spaghetti wiring in the Laura mailbox as a single PCB. This week, I will be working on another Laura mailbox, this time with a 7 inch TFT display. And that's all I have. All right, that's plenty. Don't uh, sweat it. <laughs> <laughs> I was. Oh, what a week. All right. Uh, next, I have notes from David Glode. As uh, the first items are all about the TR Cowbell, I soldered and tested my TR Cowbell in one row. That was intense, but very satisfactory to do such a big PCB from beginning to end with only two errors. I made the bodge wires for the I2C pins, but on the wrong pins, and I forgot one solder point, so one LED was not working. Tested I2C1 on Stemma QT port with a tiny SSD 1306 and the provided bigger SSD 1306. To do, invest in the software side to make use of it. And then the second topic is the LilyGo watch. Installed the firmware, uh, oh, installed the V3 firmware on a V2 watch, oops. Recovered my documentation of the variations between versions 1, 2, and 3. There's a link to a GitHub GIST in the notes document. And to do, find the author and see if I could patch for the version 2 watch. And that's it from David Glode, and that brings us to Foamy Guy. All right, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, I have uh, been working on some PR testing and reviews, both last week and uh, this week. Uh, in particular, we did some testing last week on the Ethernet library. We got some logs captured from that, got them back to the person who's working on it. Uh, they found something to fix from those and have committed that already, so we are ready to test that out again this week. Uh, this morning, I was also testing some uh, unrelated changes in the HTTP server library that allow you to have uh, parameters as part of your URL path, which is neat. Lots of um, larger web frameworks like Flask and Django and things on the PC support that. Uh, so now we have the capability to do it in the CircuitPython library as well. 
Um, I started looking into an issue that relates to the serm, uh, serial terminal group, the group that shows the serial output and the REPL on the display, uh, on built-in displays for devices that have their displays configured. Uh, that group was causing an issue, or is, I should say, causing an issue when you have multiple displays. You initialize the second one, it raises an exception about that thing being in use already. I started looking into that. Uh, but did not make it very far before I started having some PC trouble. Um, I was trying to do some troubleshooting to figure out what that PC trouble was and isolate different factors. And in the process of doing that, I managed to unfortunately make things worse and uh, I can no longer boot into that main uh, OS that's on that drive. Uh, I have been working on it a bit over the weekend. I have reason to believe that all the contents are still inside there. Um, it just needs fixed so that it can be bootable again. Uh, or if not possible, uh, I think I know how to at least connect to it and copy some of the more important things off and just start fresh. Um, but that leads to the, the last point, which was I spent a chunk of the weekend, uh, particularly Sunday, getting a backup computer set up with everything I need for uh, CircuitPython development, but also all of the uh, projects that I work on for my other job throughout the rest of the week. Um, so I'm all set up with that now. I at least have something kind of to, to fall back on uh, for the time being. So uh, back to back to running for the time being. Thanks. All right. Oof. All right. Next up, I have notes from Jose David, who worked in some drivers for the Community Bundle Light Sensor ISL29125, the Magnetometer QMC 5883L, and the Gyro Accelerometer BMI160, and finally the Accelerometer MC3479 work on a PR to refactor the MPL 31152A library, and finally working on documentation for the TVOC AGS02MA sensor. And with that, it's your turn, Katni. Hello again. All right, so last week I uh, started working on the Feather RP2040 RFM guide. Um, all templates Basically, the core of the guide is, is in place, but uh, most of it's not filled in yet. Um, the printing and pretty pens are completed, the overview is complete, and the images for the um, power management and pinouts pages are generated, which is more of the um, work on those two pages is making the images uh, than actually filling them in, so that's good. Um, again, hard report to Carter and Ed Keys uh, for helping me out with those. Um, I ordered the RFM and, uh, the RFM feather and, um, was given a, a early DVI feather as well. So, uh, those should be here tomorrow. Um, and that way I can, uh, finish up the RFM guide and then, um, I'll be able to finish up the, the DVI feather guide as well. Uh, cause I was, uh, blocked on not having a board. Uh, yesterday, I started looking into an upcoming guide and have found someone to help me with it, as I mentioned earlier, um, as the topic is something I'm only now vaguely familiar with. This guide will use CircuitPython to measure uh, VPD, which is vapor pressure deficit for growing plants. I'll likely be growing basil, but the concepts will apply to anything. After beginning to look into it, I'm pretty excited about this one and looking forward to it. I enjoy taking things that are evidently difficult to do and making them simple and approachable. Not to mention, I haven't done a project in a bit, especially not a project that is a new topic for me, so this will be excellent. Um, so this week, I need to finish up the RV2040 RFM guide. Um, I'm going to be emailing about a couple wish lists, uh, wish list items that I would like to see and learn to make uh, my life easier and um, Liz's as well for new microcontroller guides. Um, it's just stuff that I've stumbled on that I keep asking myself, why, why is this not automated? <laughs> so, um, it's not something I can automate myself, so I, you know, will have to get them involved. Um, and then, uh, finishing up the DVI feather guide and up next, next, uh, which is not right away, um, is the USB host feather, which uh, will be Arduino only, but that will get a guide with some examples, um, and I'll be working on that. So um, I have to pick up some stuff for the for the VPD guide, um, but uh, between that and the grow light guide, I think I kind of want to do those two in tandem since they're both needed uh, for the same concept. Um, so those 
will be hopefully coming up um, soon. That's what I've got. Thank you. Next up is Maker Melissa. Also, also, thanks everybody for extensively discussing the pronunciation of gist or gist. Uh, I was being difficult when I said gist, but just keep keep riffing on that. Anyway, Maker Melissa, hello. <laughs> hello. So last week I worked on writing a learn guide for the chat GBT bear. I had showed up at show until a couple weeks ago. Um, I updated the code to use a uh, better text-to-speech API and uh, better timing the math movement to the speaking. Uh, I reviewed a bunch of PRs and I updated some of the JavaScript library repos to work with uh, NPM. And this week is a short week for me, so I'm not sure how much of this will get done, but I'm finishing up the learn guide and then I'm taking a look at an issue with the STE 7789 display driver no longer compiling on the, res on the Raspberry Pi. Um, there are a handful of new boards that are showing up as unknown on circuitpython.org that need to be researched and added. And I'm gonna be starting working on a on code for a new collab guide. Uh, other, and other stuff, I'm in the middle of a big move out of state and I've been doing lots of packing, and I'll be traveling this week to look at uh, houses. That's where I'm at. Thanks, Melissa. Next up is Paul Cutler. Thanks, Jeff. Um, my project at work wrapped up, so I have a little more free time, so I can come back to the meeting, and I can also restart the podcast. So the Circuit Python show is coming back next Monday. Um, I recorded two episodes over the weekend, and the first one will be with Danny Staple, author of Learn Robotics with Raspberry Pi Pico where he also uses CircuitPython. And that book just came out a couple weeks ago, so the timing's great. Thanks. Cool. All right, I have notes from Tammy Makes Things. Last week, she was working on documenting all of the in-flight projects for her website, TammyMakesThings.com. There are some links in the notes doc. Check those out. Started the design of a simple LM358 audio amplifier and the documentation for that project. Um, and finally played around with an Elect Freaks Microbit Mini Cute Bot robot kit with make code so I can start teaching my young nephew how to build his robot army. This week, uh, Tammy Makes Things writes, fix the image display problems on my website, continue documenting my in-flight projects, and learn more about how to use make code. And in other news, lots of medical appointments this week and next, but hopefully next week I'll have some answers about what the path forward looks like. And that brings us to Tanut. Hello again, Scott. Hello. Um, like I said earlier, I was out most of last week due to Ari and I having COVID. Uh, our nanny got it too after I did. So I'll be out off and on uh, today and tomorrow until she's better. Um, hopefully Wednesday will be when I'm back at my desk all day. Um, I'm working on expanding support for the IMI. I, other IMX RT chips, and I'm looking at the 1176, which is kind of a higher tier than the 10 series, but it's clocked at a gigahertz, which is really quite tempting. Uh, I'm looking into tiny UF2 works, and I'm making progress on that, which is, I, I said it in here, I'm not sure how it does, but uh, I didn't realize that the ROM bootloader on the IMX chips will copy code off flash into memory for you if you want. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, I've also been adding a QSPY analyzer to Pisagrock to debug uh, some flash traces that I took um, using Pisagrock. I added support for the Salier CSV export format, so I can actually use my Salier to capture into Pisagrock. And Salier released an automation API, which is a Python module, which is pretty neat. So I may actually make it so that from Pisagrock CLI, you could actually just like start the capture and do all that, which would be kind of neat. Um, so yeah, that's, I'm, I'm in the weeds of IMXRT still. Um, one of the goals with all the flash work is to one, get it configured well, so it's super fast, but then also um, help do that now so that it can inform any further IMXRT board designs in case we need to pick a, a good flash with a new feature that makes it faster or whatever. Um, so that's those are the weeds I'm in. Um, if that's interesting to you, feel free to reach out to me. And then one off-topic thing is I upgraded 
my desktop to 64 gigs of RAM from 32 um, because I ran out last week and it frustrated me. <laughs> uh, so that's that's where I'm at. All right, thanks, Scott. Last item is from Tectric, and I'll read that out. Been working mostly within the Arduino sphere as of late. I've also been working on the next iteration of my parallel port C Python library. It's now a C extension, and it's been fun playing in the C layer underneath Python. As of now, mostly keeping my RP2040JS CI additions up to date with NPM updates, aiming to restart that shortly. Also planning out the remaining items for PyCon. Excited to see everyone, as well as help out with the first day of sprints if they'll be taking place this year. And that wraps up status updates. The final section is called In the Weeds, an opportunity for long-form discussion that come out of status updates or the folks have identified ahead of time. And as I mentioned before, uh, add those items as soon as you can. We have one item uh, pending so um, if there are no other items when we finish that one, I will wrap up the meeting. And now, DJ Devon 3 take it away. Thank you. Uh, I ran into an issue this week when chaining two 14-segment um, backpacks together. They both failed to be detected by I2C. I tried with multiple boards, including the Feather M4 Express, ESP32, S2, S3, and Scorpio. And the Scorpio was brand new, out of the box, just fly. Still couldn't get that to work. Uh, and this was with 8.04 from last week because 8.1 hadn't even been released yet. I used both regular I2C and Stemma with Stemma cables and Stemma breakout cables to the SCL SDA pins directly. One backpack works fine. The other one works fine. But both together do not work. It, it just... it. It, I don't know what the word is. It, uh, it's looking for something on OX70 that does not exist. And I specifically uh, soldered the pins to OX71 and OX72. So there shouldn't be anything on OX71. Um, so I have no idea what's going on with that. I put a link to the discussion uh, in, the, in the chat about it in case anybody is interested in that. Uh, I did test with other I2C devices, temp sensors, humidity sensors, put them all on a big chain, everything worked fine on all of the boards. So it's not just a general I2C issue. It localized it to something to do with the backpack or the the, the library code itself, which is the HT1633. The only way I could find around it, thanks to Katney for the idea, was to use a multiplexer. And for whatever reason, the multiplexer just goes right around the issue. And I have both of them working now, but it uses a multiplexer, which I shouldn't have to do just for two backpacks. Multiplexers really only need if you go above the eight address limit, so eight plus backpacks. Uh, so I guess I'm submitting a bug report unless anyone has any ideas. Um, so that that's where I'm at with that one. I, 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 I've never done it in the weeds, so I don't know how this works, but there. there, there. That's, that's how it works notice that you're co in your code um so you, i don't know how the library works but it looks like you put you're you know using a two passing a tuple to address so i would just look at the code that processes that and it's probably messing up that's my guess are they set to different addresses and everything yeah they are set to different addresses he says okay but if you look at the link if you click on the link uh it says one is 0x71, address equals open paren 0x71, close paren. So that's not a tuple. That's just a number because it's not a tuple because it doesn't have a comma in it. But you have address equals a tuple 0x71, 0x72. So I think the tuple processing is wrong. That's my guess. And I would just look at the library first. Look at the library code and for the constructor for that and see what it's doing with the address tuple. If it thinks it's a single value, it should automatically throw it into a tuple. Right. Yeah. I, I, right. I haven't looked at but the it, code yet. But it, uh, it's it's looking for when uh, it it's trying to default to OX70, but there's nothing that exists on OX70. Uh, mm, at okay. first, something did exist on OX70, 
and I was still getting that error, which is why I put them on 71 and 72, just okay. to just to single that out. So, yeah, that's. But it's looking I, on OX70, so somehow the default is being applied. And I don't know yeah. Why. Okay. Yeah, that might be a bug on the library then. Um, yeah, it seems like there's I an actually issue tested with it without uh, something that didn't have OX70. I, I would suggest just yeah, open an issue on the library. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks all for that discussion. Devin, are you are you? Uh, I yep. can't see the code right now, but um, I'm wondering if when you when it sees a tuple, is it unwinding it correctly? Into uh, I have no idea. I just I just set the addresses and let the library do its thing. I don't really okay, get the library. Uh, I think the library may have a then then it's a library bug. Okay, I'll look at the library, see if I spot anything. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Charles. All right. Unless anybody else has something to add, I will wrap up our meeting. This has been the Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for April third, twenty twenty three. Thanks to everybody who participated. If you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. And the next meeting will be held on the usual schedule, so that will be Monday, April 10th, 2023 at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. If you want to participate live in the meeting or to get notifications about changes to the date or time, uh, let one of us know and we will add you to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. It's totally free, no obligation, um, just a way of making sure that you only get the notifications if you're interested in them. And with that all said, we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everybody.